From Goobers to Gumbo focuses on both the Africanity of supposedly mainstream American culture and on the distinctively African culinary retentions found throughout the diaspora. Indeed, many would argue that despite the tendency to ignore the African aspects of the cuisines of the Americas, the foodways of the Western Hemisphere are often those of African women. Look to the articles in Gourmet Magazine referenced by Sheila Walker in her book African Roots American Cultures, Africa in the Creation of the Americas, where the Gourmet Magazine author defines gumbo as being French because of the roux that is the first step in its preparation when in actuality its name, gumbo, which means okra, is African, and another key ingredient, the ground sassafras called filet, is Native American. This is one example of the myths about American foodways that continue to hold sway. Therefore, the mainstream moviegoer purchasing a box of goobers is unlikely to know that the name of this quintessentially all-American candy is a Bantu word meaning peanut, the key ingredient in the candy. Similarly, the shopper selecting a can of Campbell's gumbo from the soup shelf is equally unlikely to know that she is purchasing a product whose Bantu name translates to the key ingredient, okra. Africa's culinary traditions are tied to worldview and climate. Oftentimes, communal values influence how meals are eaten. African people commonly share from the same pot to partake of a meal being eaten for fuel and pleasure, and possibly also being eaten for medicinal purposes or religious ritual. Moreover, pepper may have been used to disguise spoilage or as a preservative or sometimes for medicinal purposes such as pain management or temperature control. Many of these practices survived the Middle Passage. Culinary Africanisms abound because enslaved Africans' cultural memories influenced the foods of the Americas for hundreds of years. Thus, salted meats and fish, green leafy vegetables, beans, discarded animal innards and extremities, provisions, and other starches are staples of diaspora cuisines. The African women who staffed and managed the kitchens of the Americas brought their culinary skills, their methods of preparation, their agricultural expertise, and their propensity for pepper with them. They augmented their expertise by relying upon locally available and or durable crops and then added fruits and vegetables common to their former diets to those of their enslavers. Africa is a continent that has most often been visually misrepresented. This map, created by German cartographer Arno Peters and adopted by the UN in the late 1980s, provides ratios that more accurately represent the relationship between the continental land masses. The more familiar and inaccurate Mercator map continues to reinforce the alleged political and racial superiority of the colonizing nations. Another important map is this one created by Howard University historian Dr. Joseph Harris. Harris states that the term diaspora has become common in studies of African, Chinese, Indian, and a host of other communities of people now living outside of their original homelands. However, the term was first coined in reference to Armenian and Jewish involuntary exiles. Today the term is often used to distinguish between the voluntary immigrant and the involuntary settler struggling to maintain cultural connections to his or her original homeland while residing in a new place. In the case of the African diaspora, the historical account is multifaceted. 
For long before the Columbus voyage of 1492, Africans traveled voluntarily through much of the world. Mexico's Olmec heads are one of North America's most lasting testaments to these journeys, which refute the myths of the first Africans having arrived either with Columbus in 1492 or on a slave ship in Jamestown in 1619. Yet the majority of Africans in the Americas are involuntary transplants who fit the classical definition of diasporans as they seek to return to a homeland whose culture, folkways, cuisines, and languages they maintain while in exile. We might ask, what did come from Africa? Along with an involuntary workforce, the Americas also received food ways, methods of food preparation, agricultural techniques, types of meals, names of foods, and seeds of change. And it is these culinary retentions upon which we'll be focusing. Current scholarship places the number of Africans enslaved at anywhere between 12 and 25 million. Inordinate numbers died en route, and of the survivors, the majority were taken to Brazil, the nation that still has the largest populace of African origin in the Western Hemisphere. The second largest percentage went to the Caribbean, and the smallest number came to North America. Africans were fed starch and beans during the Middle Passage, and most survivors arrived quite malnourished. Later, during the so-called Caribbean seasoning period, when people's wills were broken as they were taught the ways of the New World, Africans were also fattened so that they could bring higher prices at auction. Anthropologist and Spelman College Cosby professor Sheila Walker makes note of one of the greatest ironies of this era when asserting that, quote, enslaved Africans and African Americans were involved in the cultivation of food crops. at the same time that they were placed in charge of their enslavers' kitchens. However, it seems that these women were far more cunning than their enslavers realized, for the work of historians Rosalind Turbot Penn and Barbara Bush affirm that many of these women created survival strategies that involved what might be called altering the food that they prepared for their white masters.